Hey guys, it's me Kitik G. Here is part 3 of what if Naruto became Luffy's sister. Story summary. Portga's D Ace faces public execution, leading to tension and concern among allies. Meanwhile, Ace converses with his grandfather, Garp, and worries about his brother, Luffy, who attempts a rescue. The Whitebeard Pirate's arrival sets the stage for a showdown at Marineford. Check out the sleeping zombie author of the story. Like, share, and subscribe. Let's get started present time, 10 years after Naru departed from the East Blue. Location. A bar in a town somewhere. Recently, the world had been slapped with the newest issue that occurred not too long ago, raising countless debates and different opinions from everyone regardless of their races, ages, gender and sides that they chose. A conversation could be heard as several people in the bar were talking to each other about the latest news that had been spread all over the world. I can't believe that they were actually able to catch one of Whitebeard's commanders. Whitebeard will definitely not going to stay quiet about this. Announcing the execution of one of his commanders publicly, that was one bold move. But that old guy is still a Yonko, do you think the Marines will win? So, like you said, he's an old guy now, he's probably not as strong as he was in his prime. But all of the Whitebeard pirates are strong too, I heard that Marco is only second to Whitebeard. Well, one thing for sure, this is gonna be one hell of a fight. At the corner of the bar, a man could be seen sitting alone as he read a recent newspaper while listening to other people's conversation. His eyes gleamed with interest when even another Yonko was mentioned and brought into their debate. Not long after that, feeling that he had enough, he paid for his drink and left the bar before making his way to somewhere quiet. Making sure that there wasn't anyone or anything else that could eavesdrop on him. He pulled out a small den den mushi and dialed a familiar number that he had already memorized by heart, waiting. Catch it. What is it? The man immediately grinned upon hearing the familiar voice, no doubt belonged to a woman. What? Not even a, hello, he asked in a joking manner, but the woman didn't respond. Worried that he might annoy her, he quickly added, all right all right, I'm just going straight to the point and say that, knowing you, you must have heard about this already. Portga's D Ace's public execution. Silence. The whole world knows that, she replied back with no hurry. Yeah, but the whole world is not you. He chuckled. So, what are you going to do about this? For now, we shall wait and see. She sighed. Since you're already out there, I want you to go and find that guy. You mean? Him? He asked, though he already knew the answer. It was to be expected that she wanted to find that guy after the news. Exactly. I've already told him to wait for my news, she said, because unlike some people I know, he's the most unlikely to do something reckless without thinking things through. Well in a sense, he's a lot like you, he stated. By the way, have you decided? Yes, she said, we'll proceed with our next stage. He grinned at her words, it's about time, the world shall finally know about us. When the upcoming execution of Portga's D Ace was made public, it stirred up a lot of commotion among the people. For the Marines, they took the matter of Portga's D Ace very seriously. Even though the mere thought of fighting against the strongest pirate crew of the sea frightened most of them, since they were the ones who served the absolute justice and protected the people from evilness, they were ready to take the risk despite knowing that they could very much lose their lives on the line. The news of Portga's D Ace being captured would definitely enrage a certain Yonko, let alone when the Marines announced his public execution to the world. A lot of marines would be joining the anticipated battle against the Whitebeard pirates, because everyone knew that Edward Newgate was not someone who would just sit back and do nothing when his son was about to be executed. This further led to many crimes being committed by the outlaws who took advantage of the current situation. Since most of the marines were being stationed at one place at the same time, they weren't able to fully prevent the situation from happening. The one who suffered in the end, of course, would be the innocent and helpless citizens, because of their unfortunate circumstances, those citizens were hoping more than anyone else that the marines would win the battle, to end the piracy that was supposed to end 22 years ago. The increased number of crimes was not the only thing that made the marines helpless, but it was also noted that the ship belonged to the Whitebeard pirates, the Moby Dick, had been spotted to finally make a move along with the other pirate ships that were believed belonged to those affiliated with the Yonko. But suddenly, all of them disappeared from the radar. Because of that unexpected piece of news, the marines were distraught over the fact that they wouldn't be able to detect when, 
where and how those pirates would appear and attack. They even started to become even more paranoid and thought that Whitebeard would attack the Impel down just to save Portgas. Later, they would receive a report saying that the underwater prison with its maximum security would get snuck in by a boy who would be mostly responsible for the massive prison break out of the whole history. At the same time, in Impel Down, an underwater prison where all captured criminals were currently being held, especially the most dangerous criminals and pirates. The prison itself was located right underneath the comm belt. At the lowest level of the prison which was actually for the most dangerous criminals, one of them being the second commander of the Whitebeard Pirates. Portgas D.A.S. The man was chained to the wall with Kairoseki, and despite the bruises and wounds from all over his body, he appeared to be calm enough for someone who was about to be executed. His eyes were still very much alive with the undying flame of determination in them. There was a slight smile on his very much matured face as he stared calmly at the older man who was sitting in front of him or rather, sitting right outside of the cell that he was currently in. Monkey D. Garp, his adoptive grandfather. If Ace was another person, he would certainly hold a grudge against this man for not doing anything when one of his grandchildren was captured and was about to be executed in front of everyone, despite being the one who used to keep him safe and protected from his natural enemies years ago. But Ace was not another person. They both knew that this would happen one way or another, and he knew that Garp himself would not be able to do anything due to his position as a vice admiral. Ace wasn't mad. Instead, he just greeted the old man just like how he always did. As if the one who was about to go through a public execution was not him. Like that man. How ironic. Look at you. Garp snorted at the pathetic sight of his grandson. In your situation, you still have the cheek to smile? Why not? Did you expect me to cry or something? Ace talked back. TCH, things wouldn't have become like this if you brats had become marines like I wanted you to. But instead, you brats became terrible criminals. Then he punched the floor to show his dissatisfaction, leaving a small crack. Then, acting like nothing happened, Garp proceeded to complain more and more of their terrible choice of careers, before he changed the topic to Luffy. Ace was amused though. He didn't know whether the old man was disappointed or proud of what his youngest grandkid had done. Well knowing him, he was probably proud of Luffy making ruckus here and there, causing troubles for the world government. Everyone knew that, if Garp didn't choose to become a marine, he would damn well become a pirate instead. Perhaps, if he did become one, he would probably become a Yonko or the Pirate King himself. He even acted like a pirate on a daily basis. You know more than anyone else that it was highly impossible for any of us to become marines. Ace stated. Especially when the three of us carry the blood of the global criminals. Since when did you even care about whose blood is running through your veins? We don't, but they do. The chained man chuckled, ignoring the pain in his chest from all of the beatings that he had gotten earlier. I never care about the blood that came from the man that I've never had memory of, nor do I have any debts to him. Because for me. Whitebeard is the only father that I have. Garp said nothing. He wanted to, but in the end he refrained himself from doing so. He looked at the brat that he was supposed to take care of, and sighed. Old man, you better mark my words. Ace gave Garp a grin. With them by side, victory won't belong to the marines. As a marine, he should have been angry over the rascal's words, but instead he just laughed it off. Not because he thought that the brat was making a joke, but because Garp knew that Ace was right. They both knew. Other than the Whitebeard Pirates, Ace also had them by his side. Nobody knew them better than him, their old grandfather. Even though two of them were not related to him by blood, he cared about them nonetheless. Thinking of his brats, a childish voice from a distant memory rang inside his head at that moment. Ya no grandpa. One day, you won't be able to protect us anymore, but that's okay. I'll do what you can't do. That's a promise. If what he thought would actually happen, then he hoped that Sengoku would not be too angry with him. The more he thought about it, the louder he laughed. While the duo were talking, completely ignoring their surroundings, they were also unaware of a certain someone who was currently on his way to save his big brother. Which later, turned out to be a futile attempt. Later, Ace was devastated. After his conversation with Garp, he still managed to keep his calm just like when he found out that he was about to get his head cut off in front of everyone. When it was finally his time to be transferred to Marineford, 
His heart dropped when he overheard the sudden report saying that his little brother was being subdued by a sleeping gas in level 6. That was where he was previously held, dozens of scenarios that he imagined, but none of them involved Luffy recklessly barging into the impel down of all places just to save him, that moron. It had to be said that Luffy's unknown situation in Impel Down really made him feel uneasy and restless throughout his whole journey to Marineford. All he could do was wonder whether his little brother was still alive, or if he was all alone there, which later led him to wonder of Luffy's crew. He hoped that the Straw Hat members would be able to get their captain out of that place, even though Ace himself knew that it would be impossible. With a heavy heart, all he could think about was Luffy's safety until he reached Marineford. Once he was brought to the execution platform, Ace's face was as dark as a charcoal. He wasn't afraid of dying, but he still wanted to live. However, he couldn't help but to blame himself when he saw how his old man was forced to jump into the enemy's net because of him. Ace didn't think that highly of himself that everyone would come just to save his ass, but deep down in his heart, he knew that they would come anyway. During that time, Sengoku took the chance to reveal his bloodfather's identity and the story behind his birth to the whole world. And Ace also didn't hesitate to claim Whitebeard as his only father in this lifetime. Ace loved the Yonko so much that he actually wanted the old man to become the next Pirate King, and later denied Sengoku's accusation that Whitebeard was only protecting him just to groom him into the next Pirate King. Only Whitebeard deserved to hold that title. After his identity was revealed, the whole world began to curse and wish for his death immediately. But Ace felt that their words didn't hurt him as much as he thought it would be. Because the more they wanted him to die, the more he wanted to live. After some time passed, the ships belonging to those affiliated with Whitebeard appeared, but the ships belonging to the Whitebeard pirates were nowhere to be seen. The tension rose among the marines as the time for war was getting closer. Suddenly, the Moby Dick and the other ships appeared in the middle of the bay sailing underwater by coating their ships. All seriousness aside, Ace was impressed with their entrance. As expected of the Whitebeard pirates, then he watched as the battle began and his crewmates charged forwards with their loud battle cries as they shouted for his name. He grieved for Orza's supposed death. Even though he had already expected them to come for him, he was also worried that they would experience huge losses because of him. Feeling a huge sense of guilt, Ace was upset. Upset at himself for he was the reason why they had to get involved in this bloody war in the first place. It was because he was too weak against that damn traitor, but honestly, Ace didn't regret his actions even a little bit. If it wasn't him, then afraid that the one who would be in his place was his little brother instead. He couldn't bear to let it happen. After that, Garp decided to sit next to him as a family member instead of one of those people that were responsible for his current predicament. Ace was glad that the old man didn't join the battle at least. Even he himself wasn't sure if his crew could handle the man who was considered to be on the same level as the Pirate King. Not that he doubted the crew's strength and power. With no words exchange, they silently watched the chaotic sight beneath them with a solemn face, for no matter which side they belonged to, death was inevitable. Then, much to their surprises and a bit of amusement, a sudden appearance of a marine battleship falling straight down from the sky stopped all of them, marines and pirates alike, from battling to focus on the unexpected event. Ace didn't know whether to laugh or cry or just be mad because Luffy managed to escape from Impel Down only for him to make his way here with some familiar and interesting people. The Mara Mara no MI user would be lying if he said that Luffy's determination to save him didn't touch his heart at all. After that, the world was stupefied once again by another discovery about how Luffy was the son of Dragon who was also the son of Vice Admiral Garp. At that very moment, both Garp and Ace wanted to see their expression once they found out that Dragon still had another child. For now, until he was released from this stupid cuff, Ace could only watch as his little brother determinedly fought his way through the marines with the help of the Whitebeard pirates and those weird people, with one of them he recognized as one of the revolutionaries. The sound of battle cries from the marines and pirates, the clashing sound of swords against each other, the deafening sound of explosion along with the smell of gunpowder, and the rain of bullets that took the lives of many others. The whole marine ford could be said to be a complete battlefield. Unlike its previous proud image as the pillar of justice, the whole place had now become a complete wreck. Luffy wondered how did a journey to do some coding to his ship, ended up with him in this situation. He laid there pathetically after being shot by the light man's beam, 
completely drained of energy and helpless as he looked at his big brother who was still kneeling above the platform. Guts alone are not enough. If you don't have the strength, there are things that you cannot save no matter how hard you try, Kazaru said. The admiral's words lingered in his head as he was kicked away by someone, only to be caught by old man Whitebeard. He didn't hear what the others were saying. The only things that kept on ringing in his ears were the words spoken by the admiral. It reminded him of when he was scolded once for the same reason when he was seven. The things that his older sister said were right. Without enough strength, he would never be able to win against the enemies, like what happened now. At this time, as his body was passed over by old man Whitebeard to another person, he was suddenly struck with a memory. Then be strong enough so that you won't have to worry about being beaten by an enemy, strong enough so that we don't have to worry about you. So that you, know. So that we all can protect each other without having to worry of what we will have to face in the future. Because in the end. Somewhere in the future. We will all share the same kind of enemy. It will be us against the world. Her words came true. Because of their lineages, the world had truly become their enemy. Just like what happened to Robin who was taken away by the world government just because she knew how to read some rocks. Thankfully, he and the crew managed to get her back. But once again, he had to face the same situation, but this time it was his older brother. World government. Luffy knew exactly who was their enemy. The memory and his thoughts alone were enough to wake him up and made him even more determined to fight. At the same time, not far from Marineford, the blue sky was peaceful with some clouds roaming around freely, despite a certain war going on at the moment. Suddenly, something fast just passed through the clouds, causing them to disperse into smaller clouds or just completely disappeared from view. That, something, was none other than a bird. It wasn't just a single bird, but at least five of them and they were big, at least big enough to let five people ride on their backs. These birds were flying in a V position, and each one of them had at least one person on them. Only the one in the middle, which was also the one to lead the other birds, carried two people. One of the two people was holding onto a small snail while looking straight ahead to where a certain battle was currently taking place. The person was having a conversation through the Denden Den Mushi. How's the situation over there? There's good news and bad news Dezu. A high-pitched girly voice responded. Which one leader San wants to hear first? Good. The second person said before the first one could give a reply. They both could clearly hear the sound of battle cries, weapons clashing and explosions in the background. Well, Straw Hat Luffy managed to free Fire Fist Ace. The one with the high-pitched voice said before saying, and bad news is, I can see that things are not going well over here. Whitebeard himself doesn't look good. He just told his crew to leave, Dezu, Leader San, all of you need to get here quick. I got it. The one dubbed as, Leader San, nodded. Be careful and wait for us. We'll be there in just a moment. Aye, aye. Leader San. Catch it. The call ended. Leader San took a deep breath before she opened her mouth and loudly said. Prepare yourself. Once we get there, do not engage in any battle without my instruction. The others who had remained quiet a while ago heard their leader's voice loud and clear, despite the sharp loud sound of the passing wind due to the speed that these birds use. Okie dokie. Yes. The others who didn't respond just nodded their heads. All of them were wearing a mask that covered their faces. That mask alone was just a simple mask without any design except for the two holes for their eyes to see. Adding on the white cloak with a spiral symbol on the back of the cloak that they were wearing, their appearances were completely hidden except for their eyes and hair. Even the leader wore a mask. But unlike the others, hers resembled that of a fox. She was also wearing a white coat with the same spiral symbol on its back, and there was a stripe of the color orange at the end of her coat. She then looked at her silent partner and asked, What do you think? Her companion looked at her blue eyes and she wondered silently to herself that given another few years, this guy would surely be taller than her. He used to look up at her, but now they were actually on the same eye level. He was also wearing the same cloak as the others but without the spiral symbol and he didn't wear a mask either. In his hand, was a long staff that he deemed as his main weapon. Great enough to give them a good show, he chuckled. She laughed. Why of course, it would bring a great shame to our reputation if I failed to do it with a loud, bang, tt ebao. Back to the battlefield, the current marine ford could hardly be recognized for its former glory. Destroyed buildings, destroyed ships, 
half-dying men, ice and lava here and there. Not to mention the marines, pirates, revolutionaries and even former prisoners here. All of them were fighting for what they believed in, or simply following their selfish desires. They lost comrades, but the battle had to go on. Some fought for goodness and justice, some chose their greediness, or simply just fought for their loved ones. No matter the reason, all of them eventually led to a war. The marines were getting restless when they all witnessed how Straw Hat Luffy managed to free Fire Fist Ace from his shackles. The most irritated one was probably the fleet admiral himself since the criminals escaped right under his nose. It was disgraceful and unacceptable for a man of his position. With great teamwork, the two brothers managed to beat up the marines that tried to catch them with ease. As the brothers fought together side by side, the rest were taken aback when one of the pirate ships suddenly moved forward, led by a suicidal squadro who thought that committing a suicidal mission was the right way for him to redeem himself for betraying his father. It was clear to see that the man refused to stop the ship from moving forward as he ignored the other's pleadings and warnings. But thankfully, before the ship could reach the city, Whitebeard left everyone speechless with a power display by stopping the ship itself with one bare hand. Ignoring the ugly-looking wound that had been inflicted by Squadro's sword, Whitebeard acted like how a parent would scold his misbehaved child, scolding the man while saying that his mere scratch was not enough to kill him. Then the Whitebeard pirates and their allies were taken aback by what the Yonko said next. We came here to accomplish something, and we succeeded, so there is nothing that is keeping us here anymore. Somehow, the others felt uneasiness crept into their heart, but they still focused to hear what the old man was trying to say. Even the marines like Garp, Sengoku and the three admirals were listening carefully to what the old captain had to say. I'll give you an order. That will be my last as your captain. So listen carefully, Whitebeard pirates, he said firmly, raising a bunch of denials, rejections and objections from each one of his children. Ignoring their words, he inhaled, and loudly declared as he released a strong aura that only captains and leaders possessed. This is where our paths separate, sons, without me, all of you must survive and return back safely to the new world. His words this time caused more commotions among them. One of them even cried out devastatingly that Whitebeard intended to sacrifice himself for their sake. Not denying that, Whitebeard only stated that he himself was nothing more than a relic of old history. I don't have any place in any ship that sails towards the new era, he said as he delivered an enormous quake into the city of Marineford, causing the others to gawk at him in surprise. Watching the place crumbling due to his sudden attack, Edward Newgate thought back to his past. He always wanted a family of his own instead of a treasure, and the others laughed at him for his foolish dream. But now, look at him. He had a wonderful family, his greatest treasure. That alone was enough for him to continue with his resolve, staring intensely at what still remained in front of him. The pathetic-looking Marine HQ. My journey has been long enough as it is. Let's end this, Marine HQ. While the Marines were panicking with the state of their proud HQ, the Whitebeard pirates tearfully tried to convince their captain to go back with them, causing Whitebeard to feel extreme heartache that was unrelated to his sickness. In the end, they reluctantly followed his order and began to leave with tears on their faces, forcing and grabbing their other comrades who were still persisted in getting their captain to come back with them to the new world. The marines tried to stop them from leaving, only for them to be intercepted by Whitebeard, intentionally giving the pirates enough time to escape. He really is planning to sink the whole place with his own life as a sacrifice. Sengoku gritted his teeth and clenched his fists in anger. At this rate, the entire Marineford would cease to exist if he let the pirate continue going on a rampage. Checking on Garp, he heard the Vice Admiral muttering under his breath about how the Yonko intended to end the current era of piracy with his life. On the other side, the Den Den Mushi responsible for recording and broadcasting the battle to the people and reporters watching from Sabo di Archipelago, finally recovered to show them the current state of the battle in Marineford. Also, at the same time, Emporio Ivankov tried to make Luffy to move. The boy was staring at the back of his older brother who still hadn't moved ever since old man Whitebeard told them to leave. Luffy understood how he felt, but he would not let Ace to do something stupid now. Ace. Let's go now, or else the old man's resolution would be wasted. Ace's face darkened. Quote dot dot dot. I know. In the midst of the chaos, Ace suddenly dropped down to his knees and knocked his forehead on the ground as he bowed to Whitebeard. 
He wanted to tell the old man of how grateful he was for the captain to accept him and even took him in as a son. But before he could even express his appreciation, Whitebeard beat him to it by asking him something that caused him to finally let his tears fall. Am I a good father? Was what the Yonko asked. Of course. Ace answered tearfully, which made Whitebeard laugh heartily. He was obviously pleased and happy with the answer. It was enough for him, as he didn't have any regrets left. Finally, all of them were all ready to leave the place via a warship. A Kainu who had been watching silently as these pirates acted so foolish for thinking that they could escape from this place that easily, finally made his move as he sent a huge fist of magma to the runaway pirates. Running away the moment you grabbed Ace. What a bunch of cowards. Both the captain and his crew members are all total cowards. But it can't be helped, Whitebeard after all is just a failure from the previous era. The admiral mocked them, causing Ace to stop on his tracks and turned around to glare hatefully at him. Take back what you just said. Ace snapped with a dark look. He couldn't bear to hear someone insult his father figure like that. The others shouted at him, telling him to not get provoked by Akainu's bullshits, even though they too wanted to just go over there and hit him themselves. However, escaping was their top priority at the moment. Even so, Akainu blabbering about how their father was a complete failure just because he had never defeated Galdi Roger nor became the pirate king himself, made them all gritting their teeth in anger. Ever since Ace was a child, he never threw a fit or lost his temper so badly. Even when he got cursed to death by the people that hated his blood father back then, the only thing that he did was to glare at them back and walk away. He was taught better to never succumb to his negative emotions. But right now, Ace was tired, both mentally and physically, and he could still feel the pain from his torture in him fell down. The insults thrown at Whitebeard was the last thing that made him lose his temper as he threw his rationality aside and ignored the warnings of the others as he recklessly charged forward towards Akainu in a fit of fury. All of these could be seen by not only those in Marineport, but also those who were still watching the live battle in Sabayati Archipelago. This era's name is Whitebeard. Ace declared as he threw a fist of flame to Akainu, who then received his punch with his own fist of magma. As their fists met, Ace's arm got caught in fire that gave him pain, much to the other's surprise. Akainu, who was pleased with the outcome, proceeded to mock Ace's own carelessness and foolishness for thinking that his mere flame could actually beat his magma. A fire couldn't possibly burn a lava. Ace, Luffy, who was worried over his big brother, wanted to go to his side. But when he accidentally dropped the small piece of Ace's Vibra card, he wanted to pick it up but his body gave up on him and he eventually dropped to the ground, feeling extreme exhaustion. Jinbei worriedly stated that his body had already reached his limit. Pirate King, Gal D. Roger, and Revolutionary Dragon. To think that their sons are sworn brothers, such a terrifying situation. Akainu added, just your blood alone is a sin, let alone your existence. Even if I let the others get away, I will never let the two of you go. Ace locked eyes with Akainu and suddenly felt a sense of dread when the Admiral whispered something to him. When Akainu glanced sinisterly at his brother, his face went pale. No. The next thing that people saw was Admiral Sakazuki disappeared from their view, only to reappear once again with his magma first right in front of the wide-eyed straw hats Luffy who had let his guard down. Next thing they saw was Fire Fist Ace appeared between them as he tried to shield his brother with his own body. However, instead of Akainu landing a hit on either of them, the Admiral was suddenly shoved to the other side by an unknown force. The man crashed straight into the rumbles of those ruined parts of Marineford. What just happened, was what went through everyone's head. Even Ace was confused. The unexpected turn of event left everyone speechless as they wondered what the heck just happened. Even the likes of Whitebeard, Garp and Sengoku were bewildered by what happened, not to mention Akainu himself. Garp narrowed his eyes slightly, wondering to himself if what happened to the mad dog had anything to do with a certain someone. Is it just me, or is the area getting misty? One of the marines questioned. The guy was right, somehow, mist started to appear, covering the whole marine ford like a blanket. As time passed, the mist was thick enough to the point where they could hardly see the sky. The pirates and marines were getting tensed, wondering if this was the enemy's way of playing tricks on them. WH what is that? Buggy, who was still holding on to the Den Den Mushi that was recording everything, 
pointed his finger to the sky when he saw a huge silhouette that greatly resembled that of a bird. A very big bird. Five big birds to be exact. A kainu, who had just recovered from the shock, immediately fired a shot of magma towards the birds, only for them to dodge and disappear into the mist. Scared, the others moved away from the angry magma man. Reveal yourself. Silence. Then, a feminine chuckle could be heard all across the place. It's no good playing with fire, ya damn Sakazuki. A loud flapping sound of wings later swept away the mist, only to reveal a group of people riding huge birds respectively. There were six of them with four of them wearing a familiar white cloak with a spiral symbol on their back. They were also wearing a blank mask to cover their faces. One of the other two was wearing a gray cloak, but with no mask. Even so, the person's face was completely hidden from view. The last one was obviously a woman with long raven hair, wearing her signature coat with the same symbol on the back, and her signature fox mask. The group landed right in front of Fire Fist Ace and his companions who were looking greatly pleased and excited for their appearances. Once they got off the birds, the birds then flew away, leaving the place. Akainu's eyes were blazing in extreme hatred as he locked eyes with the woman's bright eyes. Whitebeard smirked. Sengoku narrowed his eyes as he felt a headache coming. Garp simply picked his nose. The Sikibukai were surprised. Jinbei sighed in relief as he held onto Lucky who was gaping in surprise while Ace got this huge grin on his face as he stared at the group of people standing before him. Mainly, the woman in the middle. It was obvious to see that he was very familiar with the woman based on his reaction alone. Just like the rest. The Whitebeard pirates sighed in relief when they recognized the newcomers. The marines and the clueless ones nervously shifted their eyes from the high-ranking admirals, to Sengoku and Garp, to those big shots from the New World and finally stopped on the newcomers, surprised or simply wondering who the hell were they. Those guys, who are they? Kobe, who was among the clueless ones asked. He was still a new recruit, therefore, he still lacked some knowledge about those from the New World. Plus, he had never seen any wanted posters with their appearances at all. A veteran who stood next to him heard the Pinkett's question and kindly answered. The one in the middle is the Uzukage. And she's the leader of the land of Uzu. Uzukage. Kobe's eyes widened in surprise as he realized who this person was. He had never seen her, but he had heard of her when he was still a fresh newbie months ago. The one who called herself the Uzukage, who was also the founder and leader of the Whirlpool Empire, are better known as Uzu. The empire appeared from out of nowhere six years ago, and made a great reputation for itself. It could be said that up until today, nobody knew the Uzukage's real name, her real appearance, and let alone her origin. The empire itself was famous and mostly known for its citizens. That was because, it was a widely known knowledge among the people of Grand Line that the citizens of Uzu were actually the former slaves that belonged to the world nobles. The Uzukage made her appearance when she took over the ships that carried hundreds of slaves belonged to the world nobles, six years ago. She only left those working for the world government with small boats and left behind a spiral mark as her symbol. It happened again, when she attacked a lot of slave auction houses to free the slaves. After that, a bunch of papers had been spread and scattered to all over the Grand Line that stated who she was and how the former slaves had officially became her citizens in her newly arise empire. The Empire was located on an island in the New World, surrounded by whirlpools. Thus, its name, the Whirlpool Empire, are simply known as Uzu. If Dragon was the world's worst criminal, then the Uzukage was the world's most hated criminal by the world government. Aside from hurting the ego and pride of those so-called celestial beings, she also caused the marines to lose face several times, for they were unable to catch her no matter how hard they tried. Including a kind of who was mainly in charge to capture her, only to be treated like an incapable fool by her. It was good to say that the Uzukage was the only criminal that had ever escaped from Admiral Sakazuki's clutches again and again for the past six years. The Admiral's hatred towards the woman was understandable, since he was appointed by the world nobles themselves to capture the thorn of their sides. They even triggered the buster call on her island but then they were also forced to suffer a huge loss when even a buster call wasn't enough to destroy her island due to a mysterious force that protected her island. Thus, they could only swallow their grievances and give up on their advances. Since she wasn't actually a pirate, 
nor did she commit any crime that involved harming them directly or harming anyone else, she wasn't considered that dangerous. That was until she had a conflict with Big Mom, and came out victorious as she left the Yonkos territory with not even a scratch on her person. That was when the world government realized how troublesome she would be if she became a pirate. Fortunately, it was rumored that she had a conflict with Big Mom because she rejected the Yonkos invitation to join her fleet, with the excuse that she wasn't interested in getting involved with piracy. The Marines were relieved, but it made them even more anxious and wary of her. It would be good if she would just stay still and stick with her words of not involving herself in piracy, because then the world government wouldn't have to worry that much about her. And even though she had a bad reputation among the world nobles, she was also viewed as a savior among the commoners, so they weren't able to do anything that was so obvious to her as it would only bring a bad reaction from the people that might tarnish the world government's reputation. In conclusion, the Uzukage was a time bomb. But now, Looking at the sudden appearance of the Uzukage and her mysterious group of people that they had never seen before, they wondered why someone who wasn't even a pirate would be here and even seemed like she was protecting the pirates. What kind of relationship that she had with Whitebeard for her to be here? What is the meaning of this? Sengoku snapped. Are you finally in Kahoot with a Yonko now? Of course not. She answered nonchalantly, angering the fleet admiral even more. Then what are you even doing here? Do you even realize that you're helping a criminal? Akainu shouted, displeasure written all over his face as he glared murderously at her. If he could, he would definitely go over there and burn her alive. But considering her weird abilities, Akainu stood still. He had the feeling that they would lose if this damn woman decided to side with the pirates. But how could she? She said it herself that she wouldn't get involved in piracy. A criminal. The person who stood next to her, scoffed. The voice alone was enough to tell them that the person was a male. The man chuckled before he removed the hood that covered his head. I don't know what you're saying, but we're just here for our brothers. Our brothers. Two words that set an alarm in everyone's head, excluded some. They were astonished to see a familiar face once the hood was removed. Ace and Luffy, along with a certain revolutionary, gasped in surprise. Sabo. Sabo Kun. Sabo gave them a grin in response. Yo. Sabo. The infamous number two of the revolutionary army. At this point, the marines really weren't that surprised to see another guy from the revolutionary army. But if he was here, then wouldn't it mean that Dragon and his army were coming? As if he could hear the thought of the marines, Sabo smiled at them and said, don't worry. Dragon San is not coming. While the marines sighed in relief, Luffy gulped as he stared at Sabo before looking at the woman with the fox mask. Then that person. As many eyes focused on her, the woman grabbed her mask, and the mask suddenly disappeared into a poof of smoke, revealing a stunning face underneath. With three faint lines on each one of her cheeks, and her bright blue eyes, that was indeed his older sister who he hadn't seen in person for the past ten years. Nay Chan. Luffy cried out as he threw himself at her. Naru returned his hug happily. Ace just laughed when he was also being pulled into the group hug while Sabo just patted him on his shoulder. Upon seeing their leader removed her mask, the other four individuals also did the same. The first individual was a young man with a cunning look on his face. He had light blonde hair and a pair of green eyes. The second one was a young woman with short brown hair and a pair of hazel eyes. The woman smiled so widely as she revealed her teeth swinging a sword over her shoulder as she scanned her surroundings. The next one was another young woman, but this one didn't have any expression on her face. With silvery long hair that was tied into a high ponytail, they could also see a small pair of wings that could only belong to a skypan. Her eyes were light blue and there was a hint of mocking in her gaze as she held onto a beautiful silver bow in her right hand. The last man was obviously older than his three companions, especially with the wrinkles under his eyes. But even so, he was still a handsome man with a big muscular body. With just a glance, everyone knew that he was the one with the strongest physical force among them. All four of them exchanged a silent communication with Naru as they nodded their heads at her. Garp coughed awkwardly when several pairs of eyes stared at him as if to say, you better explain this situation, especially from the intense stare that he got from Sengoku. Ehim, have I ever mentioned before that I still have another grandkid? In return, Sengoku glared at him even harder. 
The nerve of this guy. Dragon has another child. And she's also the Uzukage. What the heck. Like father. Like daughter. And it looks like that Sabo guy is also a part of their family. At this point, nothing can surprise me anymore. That's a very messed up family, Garp San. You sure have a very interesting family, Garp. While Garp was being criticized by everyone else, the three brothers plus sister exchanged greetings with each other. Nay Chan, you came. Luffy cried out with tears streaming down his face. The others were perplexed to see a childish side of him after all the stunts that he pulled out and his terrible reputation as he hugged his older sister like his life depended on her. Which it did, because if she didn't appear, Straw Hat's Luffy and Fire Fist Ace would no doubt die at the hands of a Kainu by now. I knew you would come. Ace said. Happiness and relief radiated from his eyes as he felt that things were okay now as his sister was now by his side. Then he looked at the people that she brought, and smirked knowingly. You guys came as well. The man with the light blonde hair smirked back at him and said, Well, today is the day. Then Ace looked at Sabo. But I didn't expect to see you here either. Sabo felt wronged. How could I not come when my brother is in trouble? Ace just laughed at him. Sabo glared at him before scolding Luffy. How long are you going to cry, Luffy? You're already this big and you're still crying like a brat. While Luffy gave his own response to Sabo who was putting on a top hat from God knows where, Naru said nothing as she ruffled Luffy's hair as she tried to calm herself. Just a few more seconds, and she would have lost her two brothers. With a dark look, Naru looked over at Akainu. Unacceptable. Then she looked over to Whitebeard who was also looking at her, and they both shared a silent communication between them. Knowing his final wish, she merely nodded at him in respect. This action was naturally seen by the others, especially the Whitebeard pirates who silently lowered their heads, knowing exactly what happened. There's really no way, Ace asked, feeling dejected when she shook her head. So you're also Dragon's child? Akainu suddenly interrupted them, grabbing everyone's attention to himself. The other four individuals instinctively moved closer to their leader as they watched the magma man walking towards them with a disgusted look on his face. As he walked, he left a trail of boiling magma on his track as his legs and arms were covered in hot magma. He was mad. Ace and Luffy, along with the other pirates immediately tensed, as they knew exactly how dangerous the man was. But seeing that Naru was calm, they also calmed themselves. It was obvious that she didn't even put the raging Akainu in her eyes when she ignored him in favor of looking at the Den Den Mushi, knowing that the world was currently watching her. With a wide grin, she said, my name is Monkey D. Naru. As you may know me, I am also the leader of Uzu. As if on cue, the snail then changed its focus from Naru to the other mysterious four. Hide. The blonde-haired man said as he smiled hauntingly at them. He raised his right hand, and it immediately turned into mist. A devil fruit user. Now they knew who was responsible for the sudden mist. Yuzu. The swordswoman introduced herself arrogantly as she swung her sword and left a long deep cut on the ground. Nalan Yu. The Skypan woman said simply. I am called. Barlow. The last one said politely. And they are Uzu's four generals. Naru stated proudly. Akainu scowled. Does this mean that you have finally decided to side with the Whitebeards? Naru chuckled. Don't get me wrong. Like Sabo said. We're only here for our brothers, and we have nothing to do with the Whitebeard pirates. But, you do owe me for almost killing them, Sakazuki. As soon as she finished her words, her smiling face was gone as she sneered at him. Everyone turned cold when they sensed a frightening aura coming from her. I would be a bad brother if I didn't come to save their sorry ass. Sabo said as he shrugged his shoulders, earning a glare from Ace and a cheer from Luffy. On the other side, Sengoku clicked his tongue in annoyance. To think that a bunch of frightening individuals were raised together. Garp. What the heck were you thinking? Every single one of your family members only knows how to cause trouble. How could a marine hero have a family full of outlaws? Biwahahahaha. Don't worry. From now on, whatever they are doing is none of my business. Garp said cheerfully. Naru and her brothers only let out a sigh, as they were already used to their grandfather's attitude. That's good. Then I will kill them myself. Akainu suddenly declared. Then he moved. Naru also moved. Blinding yellow light clashed with fiery red inferno. 
Something was heading to Whitebeard. Whitebeard attacked. Marineford shook. Everyone didn't know what to expect when Admiral Akainu suddenly made a move by rushing to attack the Uzukage. Nor did they expect the woman to be covered in a golden light as she also charged forward and bravely received the Admiral's attack head-on. All of them watched with complete nervousness as their fists met and caused a violent shock wave from the impact. Surprisingly, it was clear to see that Akainu's devil fruit power was completely overwhelmed and suppressed by the Uzukage's golden aura as his own red aura was getting smaller and smaller. While Akainu was struggling, Naru suddenly raised her leg and delivered a strong kick to the side of his face. Thus, pushing him away from her. Because of that sudden kick, he was sent directly to the direction of Whitebeard who had been standing quietly on his spot. Like a ball that had been passed over, the Yonko suddenly raised his arm and easily caught Akainu by his head, before he harshly slammed the Admiral into the ground. Everyone stared in disbelief when they felt the ground suddenly shake and the plaza split into two. It indirectly separated himself with the marines from the pirates, causing most of them to go into a state of panic. What the heck, he didn't even hold back his strength. And what was even more unbelievable to everyone there was the fact that Akainu was defeated in less than a minute. Looking at the bloodied form of the admiral, they weren't even sure if the man was still alive. That one brutal move from Whitebeard completely knocked him out. People wondered if kicking Akainu to the direction of the Yonko was just a coincidence from the Uzukage or not. What kind of devil fruit allowed her to glow in a golden light anyway? Not knowing what others thought of her, the woman herself looked quite satisfied when she saw the unmoving state of the Admiral. As for Whitebeard, he also felt a great sense of satisfaction when he looked down at the unconscious state of Akainu. He guessed that the man's energy had probably been half-drained by that brat before he was sent over to him. Or else, Akainu wouldn't have to suffer a humiliating loss this easily. Feeling that it wasn't enough, Whitebeard kicked him away from him like he was kicking a pebble on the street. Just treat this as a little payback for almost killing his son. Suddenly, feeling the familiar pain from his sickness, he forced down the blood in his throat and cursed silently to himself. He didn't need to further worry the other brats by coughing blood now. As he was dead sure that his time was almost up, he made a final decision and looked towards Marco who finally managed to free himself from the troublesome cuff. Sensing that he was being stared at, Marco looked in surprise when his father was staring at him with a knowing smile. I leave the rest under your care. Whitebeard simply said, leaving no room for argument. Marco was taken aback for a while. His palms were sweating and his heart was beating furiously as he processed his father's words. Gritting his teeth, he was torn from the inside as he was struggling with his inner self. He knew what Whitebeard was trying to say, and Marco couldn't find it within himself to accept it. Marco. Whitebeard called out his name. Marco clenched his fists, then finally let out a sigh. With tears in the corner of his eyes, he shouted. Everyone, we're leaving this place. The Whitebeard pirates and their allies naturally saw the brief interaction between Marco and Whitebeard and also heard the words spoken by the Yonko. Hence, despite feeling like they were dying, they didn't say anything when Marco ordered them to leave. They obediently went to board the available ships for them to use to escape from this place. Being the fleet admiral he was, Sengoku would be crazy if he just let these pirates go just like that. With a command from him, the marines roared as they charged forward to stop the pirates from escaping. You guys leave too, Naru said. She was still glowing in that mysteriously golden light. I will stay behind to guard your back. And yes, including you, Sabo. Are you sure? Sabo raised his eyebrows at her. He didn't even have the chance to fight anyone yet, now she was telling him to leave. Don't worry, I have my team with me. She said. We'll meet up later. Sabo looked over to her so-called team, who looked confidently at him, and said, fine. But be careful. Naru nodded. All right, let's go. Sabo said to Ace and the others. But before they could even take a step forward, Luffy suddenly wobbled and almost hit the ground if it wasn't for Jinbei's quick reflex of catching his arm. Seeing the worried look on the siblings of the younger man, Ivankov immediately explained what Luffy had gone through to survive to get here, only for the younger boy to be scolded. Despite looking so pathetic for not being able to move his body at the moment, Luffy just laughed sheepishly at their nagging before he passed out for good. The three just looked at each other and sighed, 
before Ace took the younger brother and carried him on his back. Ace and Sabo gave one last look at Naru before they went ahead and followed the others to the nearest ship. Seeing them leaving, Naru then turned around to face her team. Do what you have to do. Make sure to not let anyone else get in their way. As you wish, Yuzu responded with a crazed look on her face before she went off to join the battle. Don't worry boss. Hyde gave her a thumbs up before he simply used his Devil Fruit's ability to cast a thick layer of mist over a group of marine nearby. He then became one with it as his body disappeared into the mist, before he started to launch his attack on the poor marines. Yu nodded to Naru, her small pair of wings grew bigger before she flew away to the sky with her bow in one hand. Taking one feather from her wing, the feather unexpectedly turned thinner and sharper as it resembled an arrow. She then fired the arrow, causing a huge explosion on where it landed. Barlow, being a man of few words he was, he simply just went ahead to block some marines from advancing further. With her sharp eyes, Naru could see a tiny little bee hovering closely near the man and smiled knowingly. Despite the place being separated into two, it didn't stop the marines from accomplishing their goal to capture the pirates. At the corner of her eyes, Naru saw a certain empress and her pet snake sneakily leaving the place, but she didn't pay much attention to the snake empress when she felt something coming on her way. Naru narrowed her eyes as she easily dodged the incoming attack from a certain admiral, causing quite a lot of damage at where she once stood. That's a very interesting devil fruit you have there. Kazaru commented. To think that you even managed to cause such a thing to happen to Sakazuki. What kind of devil fruit is that? Oh, I thought we all saw how it was Whitebeard who dealt the last blow to him. Why are you blaming me? Naru replied. Both of them were floating in the sky, trying to guess each other's weakness. Kazaru grinned slightly at her. But we all know that you did something with your power first. Naru chuckled but didn't deny his words. She only said, Devil fruit. Sorry to disappoint you, but I eat no such thing. However, it is rumored that you're supposed to be the fastest man alive. Kazaru answered by suddenly appearing next to her, seemingly ready to throw a punch. However, he was surprised when she did nothing to move out of the way. But he was even more surprised when she just grabbed his fist with a tight grip, before she proceeded to throw him away directly into the direction of the almost ruined Marine HQ as if he was a rag doll. Once his body crashed into the building, he was shocked to see a big pair of eyes staring down at him. Dot, dot, dot. Meanwhile, on Hyde's side, as soon as he coated the area within his range with his Devil Fruit's ability, he attacked the Marines one by one using a sneaky move as he had done so many times before. Since he could just transform into a mist, he could easily be one with it and do a surprise attack upon his unsuspecting enemy. But in order for him to land a solid hit, he had to separate himself from the mist, thus exposing his solid body to the enemy at the same time. This mist of him wasn't just a normal mist. Once a person had been exposed to his mist for a longer period of time, the victim's strength and five senses would be affected. The longer the person was strapped in his mist, then he might as well be dead. With a weak body that couldn't even see, hear, taste, or feel anything around you, what can you do? Of course, if someone who could use hockey or a damn weapon made of Kairosaki land a hit on his solid body, then the mist would eventually disappear as his Devil Fruit's ability would be cancelled. In fact, just one tap was enough. It was such a stupid weakness. Musing over his thoughts, a moment of carelessness almost got himself assaulted by a certain marine captain. A Logia type, huh? Hyde commented as he swung his leg to give a kick, only for his opponent's half-body to turn into a smoke smoke then you must be captain smoker really he could change into smoke and he even smoked two cigars what a character he was hyde thought instead of saying anything smoker dodged another kick aim to his leg seeing the familiar blackness around the blonde's leg smoker cursed under his breath a hockey user well of course someone from the new world would know how to use hockey what the heck did he even expect oi Pay attention to your surroundings. A voice appeared on his left. Then he felt a kick under his chin. Damn hockey user. Dot, dot, dot. At Yuzu's side, beating her opponents easily, the brown-haired woman didn't even hesitate to cut them down one by one, causing blood to be splattered here and there. 
With how easy she managed to deal with most of them, Yuzu wasn't impressed. Instead, she felt bored. TCH, weaklings. She said apathetically as she slashed another person. She didn't even look properly when a female suddenly charged foolishly at her with such a loud battle cry. Once again, Yuzu didn't hesitate to slash her. Why were some of them even yelled if they wanted to take her down? It was stupid, she thought. Bunch of idiots, she scowled. Then, if you're that bored, then I shall play with you. A man snickered. And she was met with a familiar string that almost cut off her neck. Yuzu immediately grinned. Well well well. She looked up, and saw a familiar man in the air. Good to see you again, Doflamingo. I see that your taste in fashion has become worse. The grin on his face didn't falter, but she knew that he was at least annoyed with her. I didn't know that you're interested in life outside of Mary Geoys, Dorothy. He said instead of responding to her comment. Fufufufufu, it's Yuzu now. Plus, why would I want to live a boring life, facing a bunch of retards when I can just do more fun things out here? She snickered. Wasn't that also why you became like this? Blocking another attempt to cut off her limbs, Yuzu continued. Oh wait, unlike me, you didn't actually have a choice in the first place. Ahahahaha. With that, she twirled her body around, slashing his strings and everything in her way, causing deep cuts everywhere. Between you and me, you were the one who has fallen from grace, Doflamingo. You're a disgrace. Ahahahahaha. Dot, dot, dot. On Yu's side, as a marksman, Yu focused on those who had bypassed her teammates. Even when so many of them were trying to shoot her with their guns or bazookas, she merely flew away. In return, she grabbed a few of her feathers, and fired them back to her attackers. Mainly, to their weapons. Boom. Their bazookas exploded. She fired another one. Another explosion. The more she fired those feathers that had turned into dozens of arrows, more explosions happened underneath her. With her long silvery hair, her big beautiful silver wings, and her beautiful silver bow, nobody there could deny that you resembled that of an angel. An angel that would cause destruction. For her, she considered herself to be a fallen angel, as she did fall from the sky after all. Aiming at the one who tried to do a sneak attack upon her leader, she fired, and the man fell to the ground. You saw her leader looked up at her with a smile, and she was glad that she could be useful. Even though she knew that her leader didn't need anyone to protect her. Dot, dot, dot. With two admirals already down, Aokiji wasted no effort on the escaping pirates. Instead, he focused more on the bigger threat. The Uzukage and her companions. Honestly, like Akainu, this wasn't his first time encountering the unpredictable woman. In fact, he was also involved with the mission to wipe out her little empire from the face of the world. Crossing the sea full of whirlpool was not a hard task for him as he could just freeze the sea. That was the sole purpose of him being required to join the useless mission. To freeze the damn sea and make way for them to reach her island, only for their journey to be wasted anyway. At first, even he was baffled when two admirals were to be sent over, wondering how much of a threat could a newly rising empire possess anyway. That was it until they found out that they couldn't even step foot inside the shallow part that surrounded the island. There was this invisible force that acted as a wall to prevent them from trespassing, which was actually quite interesting as he hadn't encountered anything like that before. And that invisible force also absorbed every attack that had been thrown. His ice, yes. Akainu's magma, yes. Cannonballs, absolutely. It was as though that whatever the thing was, was actually, eating, them. That was when they knew that the Uzukage was definitely someone who held the potential of being a bigger threat to the world government than Dragon himself. Thus, they returned back with their first ever failed mission to obliterate an empire, even with a buster call and two strong admirals. However, since she did nothing other than pissing off the world nobles by stealing their slaves, Aokiji wasn't interested to bother himself with her matters at all. But who would have thought that the person herself was the granddaughter of Gar? She even came here for the sake of her brothers and purposely revealed her identity to the world. Why? Why now? Aokiji didn't understand. All in all, Monkey D. Naru was someone that they couldn't underestimate anymore. No, that was wrong. She was someone that they shouldn't have underestimated from the very beginning. 
Just like how the Straw Hats crew was underestimated before, and now look at the result. Even the four companions of the Uzukage were not to be underestimated either. In fact, he just saw the Skypan woman used her own feathers as her arrows. The last time he checked, no Skypan could do what she did. She was no doubt a devil fruit user. Seeing the older man from Naru's group blocking the other marines from advancing further, Aokiji chose to confront him. The admiral hardened his arms with ice, and launched an attack to the back of Barlow's head, only for him to turn around and block Aokiji's arms with his own muscular arms. Aokiji wasn't surprised to see that his attack was blocked. He glanced at Barlow's arms, completely coated in hockey, and was impressed. This guy knew exactly how to counter a devil fruit user. As expected of someone who lived in the new world. However, in a brief moment, he was distracted by what seemed like a bee floating around his opponent. But that didn't mean that he had lowered his guard, as one moment of carelessness could be the reason for a losing battle. He also didn't say much. Neither did Barlow who didn't hesitate to attack the ice man as he swung his arm towards his opponent, who raised an ice shield just in time. At the same time, Naru was still at the same spot as before. Her chakra cloak had already been deactivated. While the others were busy fighting with each other, Naru made sure that every single one of the Whitebeard pirates could board the available ships, leaving no one behind. Marco had already informed her earlier that they would be leaving soon. She only told him to go ahead with the rest without her. From where she was, she could clearly see how her team was doing. Yu was in the air, shooting people here and there. Hyde was messing around with the smoky guy who smoked two cigars at the same time. Barlow was engaged in a fight with Aokiji, who was the nicest among the three admirals that she met. And Yuzu was trying to kill Doflamingo over there. Sigh. It had been at least nine years since they met and the woman was still as crazy as ever. Or rather, she had become even crazier than before, as Hyde had once said. That's what you get for letting a crazy rich girl tag along. A familiar grumpy voice complained. Oh hush. Yuzu is a nice person. She bickered back. Really though, the brown-haired woman may look like a mad bloodthirsty woman as she swung her sword aggressively against a Sikibukai, but she was also a good person. Her craziness was a good kind of craziness, but only for those that she genuinely liked. Then she would turn into a psycho kind of crazy once she faced her opponents. When are you going to let me out? I'm bored. Karama yawned. Later, she said. Well make it faster. Soon, Karama. Karama snorted. Naru glanced around the place, and couldn't help but to frown at the negativity that she could sense here. Especially at that one corner where she just threw Kazaru at. Instead of telling them that another unwanted group with a bad vibe was here as they stayed in the shadows, waiting for their time to come out, Naru chose to just let the admiral know. She detected them the moment they landed on this place, and she was surprised that none of the so-called high-ranking marines like Garp and Sengoku had yet to detect them. That must have been because the old goat was too busy ordering his men to catch the pirates instead of doing it himself, while her grandfather was just standing beside him as he laughed. Turning her attention away from them, Naru looked at Whitebeard next and frowned even more when she saw how his face was getting even paler than usual. She knew that his condition was getting worse. That old guy would not be able to keep it much longer at this rate. He knew that, she knew that, and his crew knew that. They all knew that his time was almost up. And that was why he chose to remain here. The least I can do is to keep my children safe. You will help me right, brat. Of course. And he laughed heartily, greatly pleased and at ease. Naru wanted to help, but she couldn't help someone who didn't want to be helped. Hence, she could only let Ace and the others leave this place safely while she stayed behind to guard their back. Pay attention. Karama said sharply. They're starting to move. As soon as he finished his words, she saw the Marine HQ suffered another explosion as Kazaru flew off to the sky and shot a continuous energy blast to the already destroyed building. The others looked at him in confusion. What are you doing? Sengoku snapped at him. He already had enough troubles, he didn't need his own subordinate to cause more troubles for him. Upon noticing that something was wrong, everyone automatically paused whatever they were doing to see what was going on. Naru's team even abandoned their battles, and went back to stand by her side. We have another company, Aokiji, 
who had a moment of realization said as he eyed a certain place sharply. When all of the smoke and dust finally cleared up, they saw a huge giant staring down at them. Not only the giant, but there were also some familiar individuals, wearing the prisoner outfit. It was the Blackbeard Pirates, plus some highly dangerous criminals that were not supposed to be here. Ziahahaha, it's been a while, today is such a nice day to witness your death, old man. Seeing that it was truly Marshal D. Teach, Da Flamingo was the first to react as he laughed in amusement. Brilliant. Now this is a pretty turn of events. Whitebeard narrowed his eyes as he clenched his weapon tighter. The sudden appearance of Blackbeard and his companions caused an extreme reaction from both sides. The pirates were agitated because that traitor actually dared to show himself right in front of them, while the marines were anxious because those wearing the prisoner outfit were exactly the criminals that were supposed to face a death penalty soon. It was said that these people were the most terrible criminals the world had ever known to the point where they had to be erased from the world due to their brutal acts in the past. The fact they were now walking free was already an unthinkable sight to them, let alone the sight of Shiryu among them. The marines were baffled. Wasn't this a huge betrayal to the marines? What the heck? What are they even doing here? For the love of God. Why do unexpected people keep on popping from out of nowhere? While the furious Sengoku was busy questioning the sudden act of the Blackbeard pirates and Shiryu, Naru made sure to activate a barrier seal that she learned from Jiraiya once to prevent the Whitebeard pirates from being reckless just to kill Blackbeard. Especially a certain someone. And that certain someone was currently banging his fists on the invisible barrier as he yelled out angrily, let me out. I will kill that traitor myself. Stop it. Ace. Sabo tried to hold back his brother, momentarily forgetting that Naru's shield couldn't be breached from either outside or inside. Once Blackbeard had finished with his dramatic speech that made the fleet admiral Sengoku speechless, Whitebeard suddenly aimed his infamous quack punch with a great amount of killing intent towards Blackbeard. His sudden action caused that place to crumble completely. But to everyone's surprise, Blackbeard and his group managed to survive that attack with little to no scratch on them unlike Whitebeard, whose condition had gotten even worse to the point where Naru could feel that his life was fading away fast. She was so anxious that it made her consider whether to just head over there and support him. But Kurama's words stopped her. You know this will happen sooner or later. She clenched her fists. I know. And you know that even if you can, he will never allow you to help him. I know, Kurama. In this world, you cannot help everyone. Naru didn't respond to that, but she knew that he was right, and she agreed with him. She had been living here longer than her life in the elemental nation. And as she met a lot of different people, Naru learned from their interactions. And one of the things that she learned from her journeys in these past 10 years was that people here valued pride more than their lives. Just like the prideful Whitebeard who was too prideful to accept her help. At first, it went against her conscience. After all, she used to be the hero who always helped people in need. But that was in the past. In this life, she had to learn to not get involved in everyone's businesses and only help those who genuinely need her help. Don't want her help. That was fine. Be it that way. Just like old man Whitebeard here. She watched as he struggled not to show them his pain and weakness as he claimed that he would never consider that traitorous bastard as his son anymore. Teach killed a crew member, a family, and Whitebeard would never forgive him for that. At that moment, Marco tried to bypass her barrier as he couldn't stand to watch his old man in pain like that. But Whitebeard merely warned them that none of them shall interfere before he gasped in pain, causing the others to be more anxious for him. The candle of light was almost out, and he still wanted to avenge the poor thatch. Accepting Whitebeard's threat like a challenge, Blackbeard started to let out a visible black aura around him as he cried out, Black Hole. The black aura appeared from below his feet before starting to expand until it reached Whitebeard. This is the power of the devil fruit that I stole after killing Thatch. The mightiest power, the Yami Yami no Mi, Blackbeard declared. Then he went to insult Whitebeard along with Thatch when the latter was already dead, causing dissatisfaction from the Whitebeard pirates. Naru thought that it was fine if Whitebeard didn't want to be helped but she sure hoped that he would wipe out that annoying smile on the traitor's face as soon as possible before she did it herself. Just as Blackbeard was bragging about how the other devil fruits were useless against him after absorbing Whitebeard's own attack with his, 
Black Vortex, Whitebeard surprised everyone again by using his weapon with only pure strength to land a heavy blow on Blackbeard. The Yonko then slammed him hard on the ground, causing him to groan in pain as blood started to flow out of where he was injured by the old man. Said old man then used the hilt of his weapon to keep him in place and commented on how his overconfidence and carelessness were his weaknesses. Then, just as when Whitebeard was about to deal a killing blow on him, Blackbeard shamelessly used the, I'm your son, tactic against him. The act only angered the Yonko even more as he ignored his pleas and crushed him anyway, causing the impact from his power to produce more smoke and dust that instantly covered the old man's form from everyone's view. Once everything was cleared up by the passing wind, the people behind Nauru were disappointed to see that Blackbeard was still alive despite all that. Nauru could feel that the old man actually put a lot of power behind that blow, but he himself was getting weaker so it wasn't enough to kill Blackbeard. The Whitebeard pirates suddenly got excited as they urged and encouraged their old man to finish off that bastard, only for him to stay unresponsive to their words. He only has at least two minutes left, Nauru san. She heard you said. With his current condition, I have estimated that he could last no more than that. Those who practiced Kanbunshoku hockey or were nearby would naturally hear what she said. The Whitebeard pirates were disheartened, and Nauru just stared blankly at the back of the Yonko with a heavy heart. If only he accepted her offer back then. On the other hand, Blackbeard was baffled with what just happened. How could a dying person even have that much strength left? Looking like he was going through a hysteric moment as he cursed Whitebeard to just drop dead, he then ordered his subordinates to attack him. And attack him they did. The others could only watch helplessly as their dying father was attacked by the enemies while they stayed here, not being able to do anything. But even if they could, they have to respect their old man's order, even if it meant that he was going to die in front of them. Ace looked at his old man, and just like the rest, he also cried as their hatred for Teach grew more and more. Looking at his older sister who trapped them here so that they wouldn't try to help Whitebeard, Ace didn't even blame her for doing this. They all knew that she did this for them. They knew that their old man could be saved if he would just listen to Nauru, but he refused. Ace wondered if Nauru was hurting as much as he did for not being able to save someone even though she could. He wanted to say to her that she shouldn't blame herself, but the words were caught in his throat as he couldn't even say anything due to his messed up emotions. The worried Sabo who loyally stood next to Ace looked at him in sadness. The only thing he could do was continue to support his brother as he placed a hand on his shoulder. While Blackbeard and his subordinates were mocking and wondering whether the darn old man had finally died, they were startled when the man whom they thought was dead, suddenly spoke once again. It's not you, Whitebeard said slowly, despite the pain that he felt. The blood from his wound kept on dripping to the ground, and there was an acceptance in his eyes that couldn't be seen by anyone but one. Garp stared into Whitebeard's eyes and sighed to himself. Roger must have told him about what he learnt, he thought. The person that Roger is waiting for, certainly is not going to be you, Teach. Remember, there are many who shall carry on Roger's will, and the Chosen One will be among them. And no matter how much you try, none of you will be able to wipe out the will of flame that has been inherited since ancient times. He huffed in pain, trying to catch his breath. Someday, someone will appear, carrying the history of all those decades behind their back, and challenge the world to a fight. At the word, world, he looked at the flag of the world government. And at that moment, he and a certain vice admiral shared a glance before he closed his eyes as he reminisced the memories from his childhood to his prime, finding himself a family, and lastly the last conversation that he had with Roger. Staring at Sengoku, he continued, you guys in the world government all fear for the day to come. Sengoku was nervous, regardless of what that whitebeard was trying to say, he was damn sure that nothing good would come out of his mouth. I don't care about myself, but as soon as someone finds that great treasure, the world shall no longer belong to you, world government. Sengoku widened his eyes in horror. No way. Stop. Don't say it. The day would definitely come, sooner or later. Whitebeard smirked. He then took a deep breath and loudly shouted for the whole world to hear his last words. One piece does exist. Then no more. Edward Newgate died while standing proudly after telling the whole world that the greatest treasure was out there, waiting for a new owner to come and own it. 
Naru clenched her fists while the Whitebeard pirates mourned loudly for their old man's death. Sengoku cursed Whitebeard for what he said. There were others who paid respect to Whitebeard's death by lowering their heads in silence. All in all, he was still a legendary man. Others were too stunned to do anything, and there were also those who cheered for the Yonko's death or simply laughed in amusement as a certain Sichibukai did. Marco, Naru called out to the new captain who was crying. Go, leave the rest to me. The man stared at her then he nodded as he forced himself to be strong. Not even bothering to wipe his tears, he ordered the rest to set sail for real this time. Naru still needed to make sure that they would be able to leave this place alive. She promised Whitebeard that, and she shall fulfill her promise. Staring at the back of the deceased Yonko that didn't even have the slightest injury as he proudly displayed his Jolly Roger to the world, Naru thought back to the conversation that they once had. You only have life, actually to be frank, you're going to die soon. She said, one hand underneath her chin as she lazily observed the man in front of her. He knew, but he still tried to play along. Gararara. He laughed before taking a sip of the sake in that huge cup. Bold. Matt. How long? Old man, you're not even going to last a year. She stated, looking at the ocean as she suddenly thought of Ace who stubbornly chased after a certain traitor. Who knew what the brat was doing now? Sighing. She then looked at the still smiling Whitebeard, before glancing at those medical equipment connected to his body and she grimaced. I can do something about it, you know. Your illness I mean. He just laughed at her words, and she wondered if he thought she was lying or something. Brat, let me tell you a story of a dying man. Instead of concerning himself with his illness, he lived the rest of his life to the fullest. Naru then stared at the sky and thought to herself. Is this what you wanted? To die with no regrets? Why, was it because you had already lived your life to the fullest? Knowing him, that must be it. He achieved his goals, he had gotten himself a family, and he lived his life to the fullest. Just like Roger did, don't hang around anymore. But our father, have you forgotten our captain's final order? Leave now. While the others were escaping as the ships were starting to move, Naru frowned when she noticed the wicked smile plastered on Blackbeard's face. She saw his crew taking out a suspicious black cover from out of nowhere and immediately sensed that something was not right. Trusting her instinct, she quickly went to stand protectively in front of Whitebeard's lifeless body that was getting colder. And what are you bastards trying to do now huh? She glared at them dangerously as she leaked out her own killing intent. You! Blackbeard cried out in surprise. How could he be so careless to forget about this darn woman's presence? With this demon here, how could he proceed with his plan now? If he missed this opportunity now, then he could say goodbye to the old man's devil fruit. Clicking his tongue in annoyance, he hesitated for a while before he finally let his greed and selfishness to consume his rationality as he ordered the rest to attack her. Attack her! Kill that woman now! He yelled out in a frantic manner. Damn you, teach, what are you trying to do to my sister, you bastard? Ace cried out in anger upon seeing the commotion. Even Sabo was gritting his teeth in anger next to him. Hum, pathetic. Hyde scoffed as stood quietly with the others. Despite seeing their leader was about to get attacked, they did nothing to stop it. It was because they knew that their leader did not want them to interfere. And Naru herself could easily kill anyone with her aura alone okay. She absolutely didn't need them. As for the people who were working for Blackbeard, maybe because they had been locked in the prison for too long or they simply overestimated themselves, but seeing that their target was only a woman, they didn't hesitate to attack her. However, they suddenly halted their movements when they felt a sudden sense of dread crept into their hearts at that moment. Seeing that his crew suddenly stopped, Blackbeard was puzzled. Oi, what's wrong you guys? Kill her. However, none of them responded to his words. They just stood still right there between Naru and Blackbeard. It wasn't like they refused to move or say anything, but they just couldn't. Their bodies refused to listen to them and they find it hard to even look away from the seemingly harmless looking female in front of them. They just stood there like a bunch of statues and noticed how her previously blue eyes had now turned into a pair of red glaring eyes that instantly sent chills down their spines. Not only that, but a red aura could also be seen surrounding her body, or to be exact, coming out of her body. 
The aura gave off a completely sinister feeling that struck fear to all of them who were witnessing the sight of that aura, that in the end, slowly formed into a fox head. Until it ended up becoming a solid massive fox bearing its sharp teeth to the crowd, letting out a dangerous growl at the same time. It was so big that it even covered the view of the sun as it stood protectively over Nauru and Whitebeard's cold body. The shocking thing about the fox would surely be the long nine tails swaying magnificently behind it. Everyone recognized the creature instantly. Like the phoenix, it was also known as a mythical creature. The QB no Kitsune. The sight of the majestic creature made everyone's jaws drop to the floor. Maybe because of the way it growled at them, or maybe because of the way it looked at them like they were nothing but just a bunch of ants to it, or maybe because of the frightening aura and the imposing manners of it. But none of them dared to move or even make a sound. Not Blackbeard and his crew, not the pirates, not the marines, and not even Garth. Hey, Sabo, yes, Ace, that fox looks kinda familiar. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Quote dot dot dot, maybe. They both looked at each other for a moment, before nodding their head off. Even though the appearance was different from the last time they saw it, they could recognize it anyway. That was the same fox that always stayed with Nauru. Though they were quite surprised to see the fox in this form. Especially Ace whose memories of his childhood suddenly flashed before his eyes. Hubi no Kitsune. Kurama. The Biju. Ace connected the dots as he stayed captivated by the sight of the legendary being. It really exists. Don't be so surprised. Nauru grinned at them. He doesn't bite. Like hell. Was what went through everyone's head as they stared fearfully at those huge and sharp teeth of the fox as it growled at them. Everyone was stunned. Even the giant in Blackbeard's group was nervous in the presence of the fox. Let me introduce you to my partner. And also the protector of Uzu. She said. Then the fox roared out so loud that it caused so many of those with weak will and low mentality to pass out right on the spot or get blown away due to the impact of its roar. Pleased to meet you, humans. Kurama said, smiling evilly at them. It can talk. Ace and Sabo looked at each other again. Yep, that was the same fox all right, they thought. Hyde and the rest of the Uzu team just looked in amusement as Blackbeard and his gang were completely petrified out of fear. After all, they were so close to the beast that they could be eaten or get impaled by those terrifying looking claws anytime soon. They flinched when they heard the Uzukage suddenly speak in a dangerously low tone. I don't care what you bastards trying to do. But don't think that I would just let you do anything as you wish with old man Whitebeard's body. The only reason why I didn't interfere earlier was because of the respect that I have for him. She was smiling the entire time, but that smile was scary as hell. Scram. She said. They blinked, then widened their eyes in horror when the fox suddenly made one sharp spin and whoosh. Next thing everyone knew, Blackbeard and his crew were slammed away like a bunch of flies by all of its tails. The rest watched as Blackbeard and his crew crashed into the rumbles of those ruined marine HQ, straight through the city behind it, and all the way until they left the marine fort. Certainly, the swing from all of its nine tails was so strong because those people didn't even stop flying far far away until they eventually disappeared without any trace into the horizon. After that, ignoring the baffled, dumbfounded, and nervous look of everyone, Nauru calmly sealed Whitebeard's dead body along with his weapon and the coat that had fallen to the ground wordlessly. Then she looked at Sengoku as her team stood slightly behind her and Kurama standing over them. There are a couple of reasons why we showed up here. She started, gaining everyone's attention. The main reason is obviously for my brothers, and unlike what you're thinking, Sengoku-san, I didn't and will never join any side. Not the Yunkos, and certainly not the world government. Then what are you trying to say? Are you joining your father's army then? Sengoku asked harshly. Don't be ridiculous. She shook her head in denial. He is he, and I am me. Just because he's my father, it doesn't mean that I will join his army. No, what I want to say is that, my empire is my own power. We're here to officially introduce ourselves to the world. What did she mean by that? She refused to join the Yunkos, didn't want to get involved in piracy, and also didn't want to be allied with the world government. Then, did she want to create another power fraction other than the three great powers? That must be it. With everyone there having the same thought, they all looked at Nauru in a different light. Sengoku clenched his fists. 
Don't think that we will let this matter go, Uzukaj. Sure, if you have the power, then I don't mind playing around with you. But, slowly, she grinned, before glowing in that weird golden light when she faced Akainu earlier. Then, she flew up to stand right above the fox's head. The fact that both of them were sharing the same wide grin certainly gave them a warning. Everyone watched nervously as the Uzukage raised one arm to the sky, and a mysterious black orb with some little blue and red particles mixed together forming above her palm. At the same time, the fox also opened its mouth as wide as it could, producing the same orb. The only difference was that, while both were bigger than Garp's huge cannonballs, the fox's was obviously bigger than the one created by her. They didn't know what the fuck were they making, but the situation didn't look good at all. They looked like they were about to launch an attack. Attack what? Who? They didn't have a clue. That was until they noticed where they were aiming. They were aiming those terrifying orbs to marry Geois. When realization hit Sengoku and the other marines, it was already too late. Boom. They really just fired those orbs in the direction of Mary Geois. Since that place wasn't that far from here, they could hear the deafening sound of an explosion even from here, causing them to cover their ears desperately. The impact from their attack made a huge shock wave that eventually caused the sea to split into two and big waves appeared. Fortunately, the big waves were not that nearby, or else they could say goodbye to their lives. Especially the devil fruit users who couldn't even swim. Once everything had calmed down, most of them looked at her as if she was a devil incarnate. Well, who wouldn't? With that power alone, she could easily destroy a whole island. Even a buster call was nothing compared to what they did. Seeing her power, the marines were glad that she didn't participate fully in the fight, or else they would definitely die. Like I said, if you have the power, I don't mind playing with you. She smiled widely at them. As for the attack on Mary Geois just now hum. Well, just treat it as a form of challenge. And oh, don't worry. I'm pretty sure I aimed for the place with the least people. I'm not that mean to destroy the whole red line. A challenge. This woman was simply crazy. A mad lunatic. With you actions, you're intending to become the enemy of the world government. Sengoku stated furiously. I thought I already did. Indeed she already did. But that was when she used her. Uzukage, persona and not as Monkey D. Naru. It's bad. Sengoku-san. One of the marines suddenly exclaimed. It's the red-haired pirates. Sengoku facepalm. Didn't he just face off against Kaido yesterday? What the heck is this guy even doing here? Maybe because they had been exposed to so many unpredictable things in just one day, but the sight of the red-haired pirates didn't even phase them anymore. Nor was the sight of Shanks and his crew walking towards the plaza with such a calm temperament. Well, I didn't expect it to be this way. Shanks simply whistled with a carefree attitude, smiling as he took in the sight of the barely holding on, Marine HQ. What is your purpose here, Akagami? The fleet admiral asked in a very tired tone that Shanks almost felt sorry for the old guy. Sengoku thought to himself that he might as well just resign after this. Why did he even choose to become a Marine? With such stressful work, he should have stayed in his hometown and became a farmer instead. At least it would be less stressful than dealing with this troublesome situation. Originally, I came here to stop the war. Shanks calmly said, but by the looks of it, my presence here is not needed after all. He then looked at the woman who was supposed to be the older sister of Luffy. Nevertheless, I will take it from here. She nodded to Shanks in understanding and then said to Sengoku. I have done my purpose here. We are leaving. The Whitebeard Pirates. Sengoku muttered stiffly. You've already won the battle, Sengoku-san. The purpose of this battle is to eliminate one of the Yonkos, and you did it. She said with a subtle smile. The Whitebeard Pirates shall leave. The Whitebeard Pirates hadn't sailed that far away yet, and she could clearly see them looking at her and Shanks from here. Sengoku didn't say anything for quite some time, but he knew that the current situation was not in their favor. Akainu was still knocked out pathetically over there. There was also the Uzukage and her companions. Not to mention the massive nine-tailed fox and the frightening power display earlier. He didn't even know if Mary Geois was still standing or not. Just thinking about those world nobles coming at him to complain was enough to give him a headache. Now, 
even the red-haired pirates appeared, which meant that the marines wouldn't be able to survive a second battle with them. The upper hand of the battle had no longer rested in their hands. From the moment Monkey D. Nauru appeared, it was already destined that they would lose the battle. Sighing, he knew what he was supposed to do to avoid another losing battle, and to keep some faces for the world government. Fine, he begrudgingly agreed, they can go, not like he had a choice in the first place. They may win the war with Whitebeard's death, but at the same time they also lose the battle. Hearing Sengoku's final decision, the rest didn't object. Almost all of them were suffering the worst injuries, exhaustion, and some were still unconscious. Even a fool would know the outcome of the battle if it continued. Thus, they sighed in relief upon hearing that the battle had ended. When she saw that the Whitebeard pirates had already sailed far enough, Naru nodded at Shanks and gave her thanks before she signaled her team to leave. Let's go. Without any words, Kurama jumped and landed on top of the ocean surface, surprising everyone yet again, including the red-haired pirates, that the fox was able to stand on top of the water surface. At the same time, it also confirmed that the fox was not a product of a devil fruit or anything. Naru, who was no longer glowing with that mysterious light, jumped on Kurama's back. The others followed suit. As she scanned the crowd, her eyes widened in surprise for a brief moment when she saw a younger female with a familiar appearance. That female was a marine and she was holding onto a broken sword. Naru noted a hint of anger and resentment in those dark eyes as she stared at her, and also Yuzu who stood behind her. With one last glance at the one who resembled Kuina, Naru shook her head. No, that's not her. Then she looked over at where her grandfather was, raised her arm and waved at him who then waved his hand back at her, much to Sengoku's annoyance. Bye, Gramps. Wahahahaha. That's my granddaughter. Shut up. This is all your fault for having such a family, Garp you idiot. Wahahahaha. Then Kurama left, leaving behind the almost collapsing Marine HQ. Dot, dot, dot. Once they left the place, the tiny bee who had been with Barlow since the beginning suddenly transformed into a young girl with short wavy red hair. Her name was Kana, and she was the one who was talking to Naru via the Den Den Mushi before they arrived at Marineford. She was also the adopted daughter of Barlow, hence her sticking close to the man. Since she was still young, Naru didn't allow her to join the battle and expose her identity. The only reason why she was even there in Marineford earlier than them was because she followed the Whitebeard pirates to oversee the situation and relay the information back to Naru. Leader San. I did a good job right? Kana asked as she stared at everyone with an expectation in her eyes. Naru just chuckled and said, Yes, Kana did great. It was good that you didn't reveal yourself until the end, or else they would probably release a bounty for you as well. A bounty? But I want one too. She pouted. Barlow placed a hand on top of her head and said, Once you're old enough. Like you. You blinked at the sudden mention of her name. Yes, once you're old enough like her. Barlow said. Okay. Kana nodded with a happy smile. The others just smiled at the young girl. Kids were very easy to please, they thought. At least, the sensible ones liked Kana. As they were on their way to catch up with the rest, Naru glanced at Yuzu. Wasn't that a little bit too much? It's okay. If anything goes wrong, then it's the crazy woman's fault. Hyde said with a comforting smile as he tried to assure her and insulted the brown-haired woman at the same time. Foo 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 foo. You sure as hell don't want to live anymore huh? Yuzu snapped back. Even though she was smiling, she also looked like she was ready to unsheathe her sword and cut the blonde-haired man in half. Go go. Yuzu chan. Kana cheered. It's not good to behave like that, Kana. Barlow scolded her lightly. Hi, HN. You just watched them calmly. Her wings had already returned back to their original form, looking like any typical sky person with a useless pair of wings. Naru sighed. Honestly, bombing Mary Geoys was all Yuzu's idea. Thankfully, she only aimed at the area that lacked people. The strength behind her Bijudama wasn't even 100% of its real strength or else Mary Geois would no longer exist. But she couldn't say the same about Kurama. Hey, Kurama, the guardian and protector of Uzu. The irony. And her, as the leader or what other people called her, the empress of Uzu. Gosh, 
Who would have known that she would become a ruler of a freaking empire hut? Life was truly unexpected, she thought. Then, hearing the familiar fighting sound from behind, she sighed. I wanna go home. Dot, dot, dot. Once they caught up with the rest, Kurama decreased the size of his body with only one tail remaining. Naru was surprised to see Boa Hancock and her pet snake on board. But regardless of the older woman's purpose of being here, since she hadn't been thrown off the ship yet, then she was okay to be here then. Naru only gave a brief look at the Sikibukai and a small nod. Then without wasting another moment, with her being surrounded by the Whitebeard pirates, Naru calmly unsealed the dead body of Edward Newgate and slowly placed him in the middle. Father! They cried out. Stepping back to give some space for them to mourn their captain's death, she was suddenly stopped by Ace who grabbed her shoulder and tearfully said, Thank you! For bringing him back to us! Idiot! She responded softly. They hugged for a moment before she pushed him towards the rest of his crew. She smiled upon seeing that he was scolded by the rest when he suddenly blamed himself for what happened, before they comforted and supported each other like a family should. Sometimes later, Marco and Yu helped to heal and treat the others who were injured so badly. Yu had the healing ability thanks to her devil fruit, so she was given the task to take care of others, while Naru herself went to heal her younger brother. Getting into her usual mode, she healed up most of his injuries. Seeing the state he was in earlier, that boy really did outdid himself this time. And to think that he would do something as reckless as barging into the impel down and even used a technique of Ivankov that could shorten one's life, she thought that Luffy really needed a good scolding from her. But even though she was mad, she was also happy and proud of him, because she knew that her brother truly possessed a good heart. He grew up well. Although she had left the East Blue ten years ago, Naru still kept in touch with her brothers via written letters. And of course like always, her clones over there were the ones responsible to write one and deliver it themselves disguised as a bird. Since she still had her clones around the Don Island, Naru used them to monitor her family for the purpose of keeping them safe. But it wasn't like she had to watch them 24-7, as her clones were also tasked to do other work too. Naru only stopped monitoring her brothers once she found out that they left the island and started their own journey. She considered that if they wanted to start their own adventure, then she shouldn't get involved in their matters too much. Just like how she stopped watching over Ace when he left the island three years ago, she also did the same to Luffy when he left the island a few months ago. Naru chose not to interfere in any of their matters, unless it involved a life and death situation that they couldn't escape from. Like Ace's execution, thankfully, she had enough time to do some preparations. Ace being captured by the Marines was unexpected. So when she heard that the Marines had already set a date and time of when he would be executed, Naru decided to come out of her hiding. What she said to Sengoku was all true. She came to save him, but she also took advantage of the situation to announce her existence to the world. Still, she had to thank the world government for delaying Ace's execution. Imagine if the Marines decided to kill Ace on the spot instead of announcing it to the world and wait for Whitebeard to appear. Naru would have lost her brother then, and she would have done something terrible to the world government herself. Just like Luffy's case in Eni's lobby, if he were to lose the battle there, then it would have been too late even if she managed to find out about it later. Since she chose not to monitor him, Naru didn't know what he was up to since Luffy himself had been so random and quite unpredictable with his adventures so far. Fortunately, he was lucky enough to get out of the situation alive. At least his victory over the world government made their father proud. The world government was unlucky because Naru was the older sister of Ace and Luffy. If anything were to happen to them, then she would step out of her hiding and do everything that she could to fight the world for the sake of her family. In her past life, Revenge was something that she wouldn't choose to do if she could help it. But after living here for the past 22 years, as she experienced more wisdom through so many life-changing events in her life, her perspectives of life had also changed greatly. The only things that she cared about now were her family, friends, and her kingdom. Therefore, it was good to say that Naru was not someone who would sit back and watch as her family was being hurt. Right now, Naru was inside one of the available rooms where Luffy was resting. The boy was sleeping soundly on the bed when the door was opened. She looked over and saw that it was just Ace. He went to stand next to her and asked, 
how is he? Other than severe exhaustion, he should be fine. Just let him sleep for now. That's good. He heaved out a sigh of relief. Sabo. I saw him talking to that weird guy from the revolutionary earlier. He said, and she nodded. Since both came from the same army and Ivankov hadn't been outside the prison for so long, it made sense for Sabo to talk to him. For a moment, silence engulfed them. Ace looked at Nauru who had this calm expression on her face, and he opened his mouth. Hey. Thanks for coming. I didn't expect that the two of you would show up together. Nauru raised her eyebrows at him. Fool. Our brother was about to be killed, of course we would come. Ace just laughed nervously and didn't know what to say. Usually he wouldn't be like this. He knew that Nauru and Sabo had always contacted each other. They all did. If Nauru knew of his problem then Sabo would naturally know about it too. It was just that. Ace was still affected by what happened today that he couldn't function like always. Nauru understood that. What are you guys going to do now? Ace gulped and lowered his gaze to the floor, avoiding her gaze. Marco said that father will be buried somewhere near his homeland in the new world. I trust Marco. He knows what he's doing. Nauru didn't say anything. Instead, she just stared at this person whom she had raised ever since he was a baby and she couldn't help but think of that time when he was still a kid. Despite only being a couple of years older than her, she felt like it was only yesterday that Garp brought back the baby that always cried in the middle of the night or when he was separated from her. Now as she looked at the current ace, Nauru could only smile in melancholy. With a soft smile, she said, You know, ace. It's okay to cry if you want to. And the tears fell once again. Dot. 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 The next morning, Luffy woke up with vigor. Unlike yesterday when he looked like he was about to die out of exhaustion, he appeared to be a lot better now. As if he didn't just go through multiple death situations. The moment he woke up, he went to look for food and his siblings first. So the four of them ended up spending the whole morning together and caught up with what happened for the past 10 years. Even though Nauru had always kept in touch with Luffy and Ace before they left the East Blue, she didn't actually tell them anything regarding what she had been doing. Ace only found out once Nauru went to see him, and that was after he had already joined the Whitebeard Pirates. Nauru herself was actually quite familiar with the Whitebeard Pirates as they helped her a few years ago. As for Sabo, since he was now in her father's army, Nauru often went to find him too. Which meant that she also had contact with Dragon sometimes. And surprisingly, if she ignored the fact that he abandoned his children, the man was actually a good person. It took years for Nauru to actually start treating him like a parent, but at least now she wouldn't have to pretend like she actually had any familial feelings for him just because he was her father. What he did was still wrong, even though she could understand him. Up until now, Nauru believed that he decided to not take care of his children due to his position as a criminal and that he was fighting against the government. Luffy was the same as Ace. The letters that she gave him didn't have any information of her being the Uzukage or anything. All he knew was that his older sister went to the Grand Line when she was 12 and had been living in the New World since she was 16. And now that they had met, there was nothing wrong for her to tell him enough to let him understand what his older sister was capable of. Lucky was very excited to find out that Nauru was actually a ninja this whole time. How cool was that? No wonder she could do a lot of magic tricks when they were kids. To entertain his childlike curiosity, Nauru just showed him some harmless little tricks like the cage bunshin, kawerimi and hench. Those three simple jutsus were enough to make him happy. In return, Luffy told them the stories of his adventures with his crew. Since Ace had already met half of his current crew in Alabasta, Luffy focused more on Nauru and Sabo since they hadn't seen each other for 10 years except for some letters. Now he was just done telling them of his crew's encounter with Kazaru and that Kuma guy who caused his crew to be scattered everywhere. He didn't know where they could be right now, but he was still confident that they would be just fine. After that, Luffy was informed by his sister that they would be heading to the New World for Old Man Whitebeard's funeral. Hearing that, Luffy expressed his desire to stay behind. He couldn't just go to the New World without his crew and his ship. Who knew what happened to the Sunny Go ever since she was left behind? Frankie would be mad if something were to happen to the ship. Plus, after what happened in Sabayati, Impel Down, and Marineford, 
Lucky realized that he and his crew were not ready for the new world yet. If it weren't for Luck and his new friends that he made during his struggles, don't even mention leaving him hell down because he sure as hell wouldn't be able to get close to the prison if it wasn't for Hancock. That was why, he'd rather stay behind and train for some time before leaving for the second half of the Grand Line with the rest of his crew. He'd rather earn the right to enter the new world with his own strength than simply following his brothers and sister there. How could he even dream of beating them if he still needed to depend on them? What do you think, Naru? Ace asked for Naru's opinion. Naru just shrugged her shoulders. She didn't know why they even needed a confirmation from her when they were old enough to make their own decisions. If Luffy wants to do so, then why not? Luffy's face lightened up immediately. Okay, so you want to train, but with who? Do you want me to send someone to train you? Or do you want me to train with you, Luffy? Ace asked. Before Luffy could give his answer, a hoarse voice interrupted him. The four of them immediately turned to see a familiar old man at the doorway. I can train you, was what he said. Familiar with him, Luffy greeted him first. Rayleigh. Dark King. Rayleigh. Ace muttered stiffly under his breath. This was the person who had sailed alongside his blood father until the end. Honestly, Ace didn't know what to feel about him. Naru looked at Rayleigh who smiled at her. Maybe it was a trick of light, but she thought she saw a brief sign of recognition and nostalgia in his eyes. Naru brushed away the weird feeling and thought to herself that it was probably because he recognized her identity or something. Hello there, Ace. Rayleigh greeted the obviously stiff Ace with a genuine smile. Quote dot dot dot. Hello. No matter what connection this old man had with Roger, Ace didn't forget about manners and responded back to Rayleigh with a nod. Rayleigh didn't say anything about the awkwardness in the room that was caused because of his presence, instead he just looked at Luffy and went straight to the point. I can train Luffy Coon if he wants to. In two years, I dare to say that he will be ready for the new world when that time comes. Naru knew about Rayleigh's terrifying reputation as a powerful individual, and he was also a good person based on what she heard from some people. She knew that he wasn't the type to meddle in other people's business, and no marine dared to mess with him. Honestly, she didn't see a problem with Luffy training under him. What do you say, Luffy? She glanced at the boy. Luffy held his chin as he pondered about the idea of training under Dark King Rayleigh for two years. Making his decision quickly, he agreed without any hesitation as he nodded his head at the old man's offer. Then that's settled, Rayleigh stated with a pleased smile. With his business here already settled, he waved at them first before he left the room to visit a certain captain. Once he left, Sabo asked Luffy. What about your crew? How are you going to contact them if you don't even know where they are right now? Ace nodded his head in agreement with Sabo's words. Sabo is right. Once they hear about what happened, they would surely try to find a way back to Sabayati to come and get you. You mentioned before that each one of you have Rayleigh's pieces of Vibra card, right? Luffy nodded. Then it should be easy for them to find you. Ace said. But knowing you, you must have wanted them to also train for two years like you, right? Yeah, don't worry about that. Here, take this. Naru suddenly handed him a snail with a button on top of its shell that appeared from out of nowhere and explained about its function. It was basically a Den Den Mushi that allowed the user to record oneself, including the audio. If one pressed the button on top of its shell, a hologram would appear and play back everything that had been recorded. This Den Den Mushi was mostly used for sending visual letters. While Luffy was fascinated with the snail, Naru continued. After you're finished, I will send each copy to every single one of your crew. But how are you going to find them? I have my ways. She winked at him. With a large spy network in every part of the Grand Line, finding some people wouldn't be too hard. Thinking that his sister was so cool, Luffy went to film himself on the spot. He said, Hi and introduced his brothers and sister before ordering his crew to train hard and they shall meet once again in two years at Sabayati. When Naru thought about a certain swordsman, she wondered what would be his reaction once he found out that his childhood friend was the older sister of his captain. After all, she had never told him of her full name. Amused, she thought that fate was indeed interesting. After Luffy was done, he gave the snail back to Naru when they heard someone knocking on the door. 
After telling the person outside to enter, they saw that it was only Boa Hancock who came in with a weird behavior as she kept fidgeting on her spot with reddish cheeks. Somehow, Naru was reminded of a certain shy Hayuga heiress as she observed the Sikibukai. Oh, Hancock. Luffy was the one who greeted her first. L. Luffy. Oblivious with her weird behavior, Luffy thanked her for all the help that she provided him with. Being given such a bright smile from the person she admired, the taller woman seemed like she was about to pass out anytime soon, much to Naru's amusement. Is there anything that you need, Hancock San? At the sound of Naru's questioning, the pirate empress immediately snapped back into reality and put on a polite smile on her face as she faced her future sister in law, shyly. I heard from Rayleigh San that Luffy needs a place to train. I, if he doesn't mind, I know a place. Really, Hancock? Why, yes. She nodded as she cupped her face in embarrassment. Naru's life here for 22 years plus 17 years in previous life would be wasted if she still didn't understand as to why the Sichibukai was acting like this. Thus, she was very amused to see this kind of thing happening right in front of her. Not to mention that it happened to her dense younger brother no less. She glanced over at Ace and Sabo, wondering if the two realized the same thing she did, only to see them talking to each other as they ignored the others in the room. Naru rolled her eyes. HN. Another two dense fools. The next day, after paying their own respect to old man Whitebeard, others started to leave. Sabo left first with his fellow revolutionaries. Then Naru and Ace watched as Luffy, Rayleigh and the female Sichibukai departed to Amazon Lily. Naru, we're ready to go. Informed Ace. Naru nodded her head. The others watched as she took out her gravity seals and used them on every part of the ship so that the ship would be light enough to cross over the red line easily. This way was much faster than using the usual route, which was going underwater just to reach the new world. It didn't take long for them to arrive at their destination. Once they arrived in the new world, they immediately went to Whitebeard's homeland. Since Naru had kept the man's dead body in her seal, the body was still as it was when he first died, so it hadn't rotted yet. And as Marco had decided, Whitebeard was buried on an island near his homeland. During the funeral, Naru wasn't surprised to see a certain redhead. Shanks talked to Marco and Ace for a while before he paid his respect to Whitebeard. Once the funeral was done, Naru and Shanks had their own private conversation. So, Sitting across her, was the captain of the red-haired pirates himself. He was pouring her a cup of sake, before doing the same thing for himself. I didn't expect that Luffy's older sister that he always talked about before would turn out to be you, the ever-mysterious Azukage, but that actually explains a lot. Oh, about what? She asked. Not feeling shy, Naru went to gulp down the entire sake and felt the familiar burn in her throat, finishing it in one go. The good thing about being Kurama's Jinchuriki was that, no matter how much she drank, she would never get drunk since Kurama's chakra would prevent the toxicity of the alcohol to harm her body. Very nice indeed. Shanks didn't mind her behavior. Ten years ago, I stayed over at this one small village in East Blue. I stayed there for a year and met a certain kid. And for some reason, I kept having this strange feeling of being watched. When I finally managed to detect a certain presence, it stopped. Interesting. Naru said with a poker face. But you see, the thing is that. I always sensed the same presence from several different locations at the same time. He continued with a grin. Though I didn't have a clue as to why the same presence was able to split into many places, but I'm pretty sure that was you. Naru didn't flinch when she was met with the man's piercing gaze. Instead, she stayed calm as she had already seen this coming. One time, she had almost been discovered by the redhead once, and since then her clones had stopped monitoring him and his crew. Even so, her clones were still around to keep things in check, and they were still around even after the pirates had left. As expected of someone like him, and come to think of it, combining her age in two lifetimes, she should be around the same age as this man. Yeah, that was me. She admitted casually, or my clones, whatever you prefer. I knew it. I actually had my guesses when I recognized your presence a few years ago, turns out, you're Luffy's older sister after all. He suddenly laughed boisterously as he slapped his thigh, much to her slight annoyance since he was being too loud for her poor sensitive hearing. I actually heard a lot about you from him. It never crossed my mind that you managed to raise both Luffy and Ace alone. At the mention of Ace's name, she looked at him knowingly. 
Shanks was Roger's apprentice, and he had also met Ace once when he was still at the village ten years ago. At that time, Shanks was still clueless of the fact that Ace was the kid of his late captain. He remembered that one day when Luffy wasn't around, he and his crew were approached by two boys who were obviously older than Luffy himself, and they introduced themselves as the kid's older brothers. Those two boys were precisely Ace and Sabo. They approached him for the sake of introducing themselves, as they were worried for their brother who had been spending a lot of time with a pirate crew. After that, Shanks had never seen Ace again, until that time when Ace brought his crew to see him just so that he could express his gratitude for saving Luffy when he and Sabo weren't there for him. And that was it. I wasn't alone. Naru stated. It was the truth. She had Dayton and the bandits, Makino and even the mayor come and look after the boys when she was not around. So yes, she wasn't alone when it came to the topic of raising the boys. Though, if asked, the mentioned people would say that Naru was the one who contributed a lot in raising the kids. Shanks blinked at her answer, and just smiled, of course. Alright. What exactly do you want to tell me? She asked impatiently. She knew that he wanted to tell her something, and she just wanted him to just get to the point already. I just want to warn you about what you're doing, he said. Finally. She thought. Sighing, she stared at him with a serious look for a moment, before she suddenly burst into a soft chuckle. You don't have to concern yourself with my affairs. I know what I'm doing. Do you? If you're talking about me attacking the Mary Joies and becoming enemies with the world government, then rest assured, I am not going to do it again. She said. What I mean is that, I only did that because I want the world to know that I am not someone who can easily be bullied. I did this for my people. Her people the former slaves of the world nobles. Shanks just stared quietly at the woman sitting across him. He knew that she could handle her own affairs, and he also happened to see her little display of power before, and it had to be said that he was greatly impressed. As a Yonko himself, he was also aware of the brief conflict between her and Big Mom years ago. And for her to escape Charlotte Linlin's wrath with no scratch, her mysterious abilities, the weird but great defense that she had over her island, and the legendary mythical creature that she had as a partner were enough to prove that Naru's strength was at least one pair with a Yonko. It was a shame that she wasn't a pirate, or else she would definitely replace Whitebeard's position as a Yonko right away. Perhaps, maybe she was the one who might be in his position instead of him. But unfortunately, she wasn't a pirate. Naru was no ordinary lady, and he knew that she was a capable woman. But still, he needed to warn her. As your new friend, I want to say that you should be extra careful with the people from the world government. Why? You have the Kiyubi. He stated. Naru's eyes narrowed. And why is that a big problem? In this world, they also have their own version of Kiyubi. But this Kiyubi that he mentioned should be the real mythical creature and not Kurama the Biju. Which meant that there should be two Kyubis at the moment, with Kurama being a fake one since he didn't belong in this world. For all she knew, the real one should be somewhere else in hiding or something. Not that she cared about it. Could Shanks have mistaken her Kurama as this world's Kyubi? That could be the case. I just heard that having the Kyubi is a big deal for those at the world government. So you showing it to the world that you and the beast are partners would probably trigger something. It's a, him, Naru suddenly said, ignoring the main point of Shansuke's words. The Kyubi is a male, and his name is Kurama. Shanks was taken aback at the seriousness in her voice, but he brushed it off and grinned at him, of course. He would like to say more about the matter with the Kiyubi, but knowing that she would most likely not going to listen, he raised his cup at her and said. Well then, good luck in whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. Don't worry. I have been told that I have a great devil's luck on my side. She grinned at him in response, raising her own cup at him. Knowing whom you're related to, I have no doubt about that. And so they clinked their cups and drank at the same time. Once the battle in Marineford had ended, the news had been spread to every part of the world in an instant. Many things happened in one single day that made people wonder whether those truly happened or not. But the pictures attached in the articles and the video of the battle said that yes, they really happened. The successful rescue mission of Portga's D. Ace who was also the one and only son of Roger. Vice Admiral Garb's family was full of outlaws like Dragon the Azukage, and the rookie pirate Straw Hat Luffy. The bold action of Nehru who attacked Mary Joise. The appearance of the legendary mythical creature Kiyubi. And of course, the death of Edward Newgate. 
The man who once competed with the late Pirate King once upon a time, had finally died at the age of 72. He was the legendary Whitebeard, feared and respected by many, he who lost his life as he stood as prideful as he was without even a single scratch on his back. It was certain that the story of the battle in Marineford would be passed down to future generations. And more importantly, after the battle, powers would be shifted. And those who had been staying quietly in the dark for so long would never be able to stay quiet anymore. This was just the beginning. Location. Whole Cake Island. Then the Azukage has been acknowledged to be on the same level as a Yonko. The people even claim that she would have succeeded Whitebeard's position if she was a pirate. Charlotte Linlin, also known as Big Mom, narrowed her eyes when she listened to the recent report of what happened. Due to her cold frightening aura, the people around her couldn't help but to tremble in fear. A Yonko. She hummed unpleasantly. Monkey D. Naru? HMPH to think that she is actually related to Garp and Dragon at the same time. What a frightening lineage. Are we going to do something about this, Mama? Smoothie asked nervously on the other side. The rest of the generals or Big Mom's children with a high-ranking position were also there. All of them were afraid to make any noise and offend the female Yonko, since their topic of discussion was a very sensitive topic to her. Can you handle her? Big Mom glanced at her daughter with a cold glare which froze the woman into being speechless. Seeing how scared she was, Big Mom snorted. HN, as I thought. Katakori who was leaning against the wall had an unknown gleam flashed across his eyes. Doesn't she have a younger brother who just entered the Grand Line not too long ago? Yes, Mama. Parasparrow answered. His name is Monkey D. Luffy. Big Mom grinned. Perfect. Since we can't touch Garth, Dragon and that woman, then it falls onto the younger one to bear the sins of his elders, right? But Mama, would it be wise? Cracker gulped. He couldn't even imagine what the demon would do if they made a move against her younger brother. Didn't she reveal her identity, attack Mary Joies and become the enemy of the world just for the sake of her brothers? Plus, all of them still remembered that day, and they certainly didn't want to experience it again. No worries. Big Mom smiled creepily as she held onto the Luffy's and Naru's wanted posters. It's not like we're the one who is going to make trouble with her. Mama. Then Big Mom suddenly laughed out loud, causing the others to flinch. A while later, she went silent before they heard the familiar gritting sound as she spoke in an eerie low voice. I'm hungry. Location. Don Island. In a certain bar, Makino was holding a recent newspaper as she read out loud about what Naru and the three boys did. The people here cheered as they celebrated the achievements of the four people as they all came from the same island. Only the mayor grumbled about how much trouble those four would bring to their peaceful village, although anyone could see the pride in his eyes. At the same time, in Dayton's house. Boss, you have to take a look at this. Dagra shouted as he shoved the newspaper to the orange-haired woman. What is it this time? Annoyance displayed on her face as she took the newspaper away from him. A couple of minutes later, E-H-H-H-H-H, meanwhile, in a certain mansion located in the high town. D darling. Did it called out to her husband anxiously. Outlook I eyes hands trembled. To think that. That boy would end up becoming a revolutionary. Even that demon is now a powerful empress that even dared to challenge the world government. He took a deep breath and looked at his wife. Go and tell Steli to not cross the line or else we're dead. She gulped. Why yes. Location. Shimotsuki Village. Azukage. Uzu. Kiyubi. Shimotsuki Kozaburo muttered under his breath, clearly amused with what the young girl in his memories had achieved today. He chuckled, then he looked up to the sky as he enjoyed the gentle breeze of the wind. Somehow, he wasn't surprised to know about the whole thing. His gut feelings were right after all. That little girl who stumbled upon his small village years ago, had finally started to walk on the path that was meant for her. It couldn't be anyone else but those who bear their will within them. That ends what if Naruto became Luffy's sister part 3. Like, share, and subscribe thank you for watching. Bye bye.